it was one of the few occasions in my life when I felt that there was... The whole people were with the government and with their fighting forces. And there was a spirit there and a camaraderie which was something so touching, so moving, and which elevated you so that you felt you wanted to do a thing. I mean, I had to go slip over the Pyrenees at night, and I was met on the Spanish frontier by a motorcyclist who drove me into Barcelona. Uh, it was like a death race, you know. <laughs> he was a mad, mad Spanish driver. But so that was the first feeling of exhilaration, and wherever the troops were marching, the people were cheering and everything else. The second thing was a, an inner feeling that this great movement wouldn't survive, because Franco was beginning to move in then, and the fascists were, were bombing. I remember going to a little village in Spain distributing food, and the little girls put on a dance, the little schoolgirls, only toddlers of five years old, called the shoe dance. And it was, it was beautiful and touching. And we got in the car and drove away, and a solitary airplane came over and dropped a bomb on it. And we drove back after the airplane had disappeared, and the school had taken the full blast of that bomb, and the little girls who danced were dead. So you were in the presence of that all the time. And yet the Spanish Civil War became emblematic of splits within the socialist community. George Orwell told a very different story from the Daily Worker dispatches. Stalinists, Trotskyists and anarchists had bitter strategic disputes. But all agreed, fascism had to be fought. What was the difference between what the Communist Party and the Daily Worker were arguing in respect of fascism and what, say, the Labour Party or the TUC seemed oh. to be believing? Mm -hmm. Well, they were warning their members against being directly involved. Uh, uh, it's true that there were Labour Party members who went and fought as well as any communists and died as communists died. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to exclude them, but officially, the TUC and the Labour Party's line was uh, to uh, uh, not to get deeply involved, either in the fight against fascists here in Britain, mostly fascists, or uh, fascism abroad. Indeed, the Daily Herald, which was a Labour Party paper at the time, was suggesting it was best to call the black shirts Mickey Mouse and have done with it. Madrid today, London tomorrow. Britain now had its own fascists, and when they decided to descend into London's East End, home to thousands of Jews whose families had fled persecution elsewhere, the local communists decided to organize, to organize a blockade. The Daily Worker encouraged anti-fascists from all over to join the demo. The Battle of Cable Street down there sealed its reputation as more than a newspaper, as an educator, agitator and organiser. In the lives of great nations comes the moment of decision, comes the moment of death. And this nation again and again in the great hours of its fate has put aside convention, has put aside the little men of talk and of delay, and who decided to follow men and women. Working with the paper to mobilise the East End against the black shirts was Communist councillor Phil Piratin, later Britain's second Communist MP and circulation manager for the paper. We took a decision that we must prevent them, by all means, from marching through the main roads, which were Whitechapel and commercial roads. So when, when Mosley starts to make for Cable Street, what happens? Ah, well, the signals were clear. I myself, operating from uh, headquarters in New Road, I rode on the back of a pillion, uh, on a pillion of a motorbike, uh, and came down where we're almost where we're now sitting here, and uh, had words with Ronnie Sell uh, that uh, what signals they would get and what they were to do. And there were one area of barricades which were to be given up easily so that they would come to the next one. <laughs> now, I then pointed out <laughs> to Ronnie that there were two lorries in the street. One we knew nothing about. The other one was for destroying. 
He was a nice, tall, fair, straightforward electrician bloke. And he said, what do you mean for destroying? I said, the boss knows they are for, that one is for destroying. Yeah. He said, what shall I do? I said, well, you've got a hundred people here. You knock it over and you burn it and you do things, you see. <laughs> also on the march were young students like Betty Matthews. We walked all the way from the London School, School of Economics. And I will remember along the road seeing slogans, Mosley shall not march, whitewashed across the streets. So we eventually got to Gardner's Corner where we were. And there we joined up with what was an absolutely massive crowd of people. As the police tried to make it possible for Mosley to come on his route, the more and more they were trying to press the crowd back or try to cut through the crowd. And I remember uh, seeing mounted police charging the crowd, and of course I was part of that crowd. And I just remember seeing how the police was being used to protect Mosley. And that made me deeply angry. <laughs> Having been a bit frightened at this police charging of the crowd, I um, was so, felt so elated at the end when the people won. Mosley's black shirts did not pass. The Delhi workers' reputation was sealed by the crusade against fascism. Much of Fleet Street, including its flagship, the Times, was, by contrast, abject in its appeasement of Hitler. So here you're having a go at the Times. Why? Oh, it's, it really was a very, very funny episode. The Times was most abject of defenders of Hitlerism. And uh, the, what was the group out at uh, Thames side? Cliveden Set. Cliveden Set, yeah. Your memory goes a bit, I think, yeah. Although, anyway, they had a correspondent who sent them proper stories. When his stories came back, they were printed because he didn't criticize Hitler very much. But Hitler took offense to some very minor thing, I remember. I don't remember the details of it. But just to show his authority, he expelled the Times correspondent, his best friend in Britain. And did the Times ask for government intervention, say they'd withdraw their facilities and what have you? Oh, no. They said, we're awfully sorry, we'll send you another correspondent. And that was the great thunderer. Chancellor Chamberlain, who today are his friends? Friends with Hitler. Friends with Mussolini. This was in charge of our defense. Now they've given us this. In his first speech to the House of Lords, Lord Chatfield, Defence Minister, praised the new spirit of Germany and said we should not cast doubts upon its leader's good word. Stop! The Daily Worker was the creature of Lenin. But what did it do about the fate of Lenin's closest comrades? Almost all of them had been assassinated or executed. Bolshevik leaders like Bukharin tried and killed by Stalin in 1938. Solidarity with the Soviet Union silenced the paper. Stalin's non-aggression pact with Hitler was a disaster. And after a brief but bitter conflict within the Communist Party, with the leader Harry Pollitt and a couple of others holding the anti-fascist line, the party and the paper promoted Soviet propaganda. How did communists who'd been struggling so hard to secure an alliance against fascism deal with the non-aggression pact between Germany and the Soviet Union? Well, which was a hard gulp. It was a difficult uh, uh, pill to swallow. Uh, but uh, for a long time, we had held that the British government uh, was favorably disposed towards Nazi Germany. We knew that there were members of the British government itself who were uh, um, friends of Hitler. That was known. Uh, so we believe there was a possibility that uh, they would gang up against the Soviet Union. So it seemed to us that the Soviet Union was entitled to do what it did. <laughs> 